In my new book, Climbing Performance Coaching, I feature Nikolai Bernstein's idea of movement as a problem-solving process throughout. Nikolai Bernstein's theories have had a profound influence on modern motor learning theory, shifting the field away from rigid hierarchical models of control towards more dynamic, adaptable and ecological perspectives. Considering the degrees of freedom problem is pure coaching gold. Freezing degrees of freedom in motor learning refers to a strategy used by the central nervous systems to simplify the control of movements when learning a new motor skill. Degrees of freedom in this context refers to the numerous independent variables such as joint angles and muscle activations that need to be controlled to produce coordinated movement. In the book, I use these two tennis players as an example of how freezing degrees of freedom by limiting the number of variables that need to be controlled, a learner simplifies the coordination problem. You don't have to be a master tennis coach to know if these two tennis players are competent or not. Freezing degrees of freedom and parasitic tension simplify or restricted movement, whether temporary during learning or habitually due to poor awareness. Let's consider another example, balancing on the slack line, where athletes might keep their arms stiff and close to their body, with only little sway in elbow and wrist. Freezing degrees of freedom can also show in rigid leg movements to maintain balance and reduce the risk of falling. As athletes gain confidence and skill, they will begin to loosen their arms, allow for more natural and fluid leg movements, increasing degrees of freedom to enhance efficiency and adapt to dynamic conditions. As a coach, you then know that they have progress and that motor learning has occurred. As an individual becomes more skilled, the degrees of freedom are released gradually. That means that previously restricted joints and segments are incorporated into the movement, leading to smoother, more efficient and adaptable performance. Over time, the nervous system develops synergies, coordinate patterns of joint and muscle activations that allow the individual to handle the complex demands of movement more efficiently. These synergies optimize performance while minimizing energy expenditure and error. This concept empowers coaches without needing a deep insight into the biomechanics of a movement, because freezing degrees of freedom is pretty obvious to any observer. Just look out for robotic movements. You don't have to be a master biomechanist to, to recognize robotic movements. Bernstein's concept of freezing degrees of freedom and Moshe Feldenkrais concepts of parasitic tension are of great value for coaches since both address the constraints and inefficiencies in movement during learning or habitual behavior. By the way, let me know if you are interested in Feldenkrais and how it relates to climbing. Freezing degrees of freedom can also tell you a lot about an athlete's mental state, as limited range of movement is often linked to fear. If athletes seem to be tense and tight, often this stems from their nervous system. It slows down movements it views as dangerous. The nervous system is looking out for us and doesn't care if we can climb something or not. It cares about survival. Our nervous system loves safety, function and variety. Now think of big, bold movements. You don't associate these with shrinking violets, do you? Learning to embrace and control large ranges of movements can have lasting psychological benefits. Don't think of our body and mind as separate. Instead, 
teach your athletes to enjoy themselves as whole, where everything affects everything. Embracing themselves and their abilities will help them learn how to be bigger, bolder and more in control of themselves. Then they can do anything. Bernstein's view of movement as adaptive, dynamic and context sensitive fits rock climbing perfectly. Climbing is not about memorizing moves or repeating exact, exact motions. It's about problem solving with your body, adapting in real time to variability, harnessing synergies to simplify complex decisions, and using feedback to guide precise adjustments under ever-changing phys physical and environmental conditions. Let me finish this Nikolai Bernstein fan post with explaining why you might never had her have heard of him. Nikolai Bernstein, a brief timeline of life, work, and marginalization. 1896 to 1920s, early life and education. 1896, born in Moscow into an intellectual family of German Jewish origin. Studied medicine and natural sciences in Moscow showed early interest in physiology and movement. Joined the Central Institute of Labor, CIT, under Alexei Gastev, which emphasized efficiency and ergonomics in labor tasks, an early precursor to biomechanics and motor control studies. 1920s to 1930s, innovative research and early recognition, conducted pioneering work on human movement using cinematography and chymocyclography, motion tracking introduced the concept of the degrees of freedom problem in motor control, demonstrated that reflexes alone cannot explain movement, argued for central planning and anticipatory control, showed that motor coordination is not rigid, but context-dependent and adaptive. Points and Periods, 1935, published landmark work on biomechanics and motor control, proposed that skilled movements are hierarchically organized and influenced by sensory feedback and prediction. Conflict begins. These ideas conflicted with Pavlovian reflexology, the dominant Soviet paradigm, increasing resistance from conservative physiologists and party-aligned scientists. Late 1930s to 1940s, political pressure and marginalization. 1936 to 1937, the Great Purge, heightened ideological scrutiny of science under Stalin. Pavlov's theories were officially declared the only acceptable framework for physiology and psychology in the USSR. 1939, Bernstein's lab was closed, accused of promoting mechanistic, bourgeois, and anti-Marxist science, denied the opportunity to continue his most ambitious experimental work. 1940s, continued to work in applied biomechanics, including orthopedics, prosthetics, and military medicine, but no longer on central motor control theory. Many manuscripts were unpublished or buried in archives. 1950s, post-Stalin thaw, but continued isolation. 1953, Stalin dies, Khrushchev's thaw begins. Ideological grip on science relaxes somewhat. Bernstein continues to work quietly, but is still largely ignored by mainstream Soviet academia. 1957, publishes on the construction of movements in Russian, a major theoretical synthesis of decades of research. However, it remains little read or cited in the USSR. 1960s, final years and foreign recognition. Bernstein becomes more appreciated outside the USSR, especially in Eastern Europe and eventually the West. Western scientists, particularly in Germany, Poland, and later the US, begin translating and integrating his ideas. Late in life, Bernstein enjoys some limited rehabilitation, but is still excluded from major Soviet institutions. 1966, dies in Moscow, still marginalized within the Soviet scientific community. Thanks for watching and uh, let me know if you're interested in other aspects of climbing performance coaching in the comments.